This lesson, Introduction to Thermodynamics, is going to walk us through the derivation of a formula that's going to help us to be able to calculate the delta H for a chemical reaction by doing an experiment. And when we're studying thermodynamics in the lab, we're going to be doing an area of chemistry called calorimetry, which is about measuring heat. There's a bit of theory that we need to go over, some of the basics of thermodynamics that are important that will help guide us through this derivation. So first of all, you have learned about the first law of thermodynamics in previous science courses, and this law is that the energy can be converted from one form to another, but cannot be created or destroyed. So when you're in grade 7 and 8 science, you look at different scenarios and talk about the different types of energy. For example, a hammer being held at a height is going to have potential energy, and then as it's dropped, that energy is converted into kinetic and sound energy and heat energy. So that's an example of following the first law of thermodynamics. Now, energy is a state function, and that's important to us because state functions are one where the amount of energy, state functions are ones where the change in that function depends only on the initial and final states rather than on the pathway that we take to get from one place to another. So energy is an example of this. So when we're studying or trying to find the change in energy, we only need to determine the final and the initial states in order to do that. So for example, these people on the mountain, they have the same change in energy. It doesn't matter that this person took this pathway and the other person took the other pathway. The pathway that they take to get from their initial to their final state is irrelevant, and it's simply the difference between the final and initial state that give you the change. Another part of the first law of thermodynamics is that the system plus the change in energy of the surroundings is equal to zero. And this is the whole concept of energy being transferred from one form to another. So if the system loses heat, then the surroundings is gaining heat and vice versa. So what this means that is that the change in energy for the system is always going to be the opposite as the change in energy for the surroundings in terms of the sign, okay, because the sign denoting exo or endothermic, if you think about it that way. You don't, there's no such thing as negative energy. Now, when we're looking at a change in energy, we need to take into account in chemical reactions two different forms of energy that are involved. Okay? There is heat transferred between the system and the surroundings, which is denoted with a Q, and then there is work done on or by the system. Now, for our purposes, when we talk about work, this is the same work that we talk about in physics, which is force across a distance. It applies to chemistry in scenarios where electrical energy is being produced. And also, if you think about a container with a piston on it, if a gas is produced in this system, then that's going to expand and it's going to move this piston. Okay? It's going to do work on this piston and move this piston across some distance. Okay? So that would be a scenario where work is being done by the system. So when we're studying work in terms of a gas expanding, it's equal to negative pressure times the change in volume. So the change in volume is which, what decides the amount of work that's being done. The reason for the negative sign is the fact that this would be a scenario where the work is being done by the system on the surroundings. So that's an exothermic process. Okay, so that's one way to designate it. This little table here just summarizes the sign conventions for work and heat. So when work is done by the system, it's exothermic, so it's negative. When heat is absorbed by the surroundings, that's also negative or exothermic. And then the opposites of those are endothermic, so they'll have a positive value. Now what we want to do here is look at how we can study the enthalpy of chemical reactions. And we discussed before that enthalpy is not something that you could measure at a given moment in time. 
and enthalpy is defined as the energy, the total internal energy of the system, plus the product of pressure and volume. It seems like a very strange and theoretical definition, but that is actually the definition. And it's used to quantify the amount of heat flow in or out of the system. Okay, when that's what we're trying to study. Now, one of the things about enthalpy is that enthalpy is also a state function, and the reason for that is because energy, pressure, and volume are all state functions. So this, because each of these variables are state functions, that means that enthalpy is also a state function. And that's important to us because we need to be able to find the change in enthalpy and it's going to be really useful to us that simply by studying the initial and final states, we can find that change. Okay, the bond energies were an example of how we were looking at the initial and final states of the system. We were looking at the bonds being broken and the bonds being formed to find the change in delta H. We didn't worry about how those bonds were being broken. And there's going to be other calculations that we do that take this state function fact into account. Now, to be able to calculate H or delta H for a reaction, because it's so theoretical, we need to be able to simplify it. So we're going to take a few ideas into account. We're going to take into account the fact that we know that the change in energy of the system is going to involve the heat energy and the work energy. And we're going to study this at a constant pressure. So when we're at a constant pressure, delta E can also be rewritten as the heat at constant pressure minus P delta V. And this is what we talked about on the previous slide, that work is P times delta V, and it's exothermic, hence the negative. Okay, so this is, if we wanted to find the heat at constant pressure, it's delta E plus PV. Now, we know that delta H is equal to delta E plus P delta V, okay, because of this relationship up here. Okay, and by taking the changes, keep in mind here that the pressure is constant, okay, so we've got P delta V here. Now, what we want to do is end up simplifying this expression, okay, so that we're not needing to monitor the changes in volume of a system, especially if it's a system where the pressure remains constant and where the uh, volume of the gas that's produced, um, it, even if there's volume of gas being produced. Okay, so we've got delta H is equal to delta E plus P delta V. We also know that delta E is equal to the work plus the heat and that work is negative P delta V. Okay, and these are relationships that we've looked ahead at above. Okay, so from this um, we can see that delta E is Q minus P delta V. Okay, so we looked at that above. Now let's take these two relationships okay, and sub one into the other. So if we sub this expression delta E into this delta H expression, we get delta H is equal to Q minus P delta V plus P delta V. And we're left with simply delta H is equal to Q. So this is a really useful fact, and it's useful when we're studying systems at constant pressure, which is the expectation of this course. The delta H, or the change in enthalpy of our system, is equal to the amount of heat that was released or absorbed in that system. So what this means is that if we can calculate the heat released or absorbed in a particular system, we're going to be able to calculate the enthalpy. So all of a sudden this elusive, strange, theoretical term called enthalpy has been simplified to really a measure of heat in our constant pressure system. And this applies to any constant pressure system. So in physics, when we learn how to measure heat using Q is equal to mc delta T, which may sound familiar, that's going to be very helpful to us in studying calorimetry. So calorimetry is measuring heat. Calories is a unit of energy and metry meaning measurement. So when you're in the lab, you're performing calorimetry experiments. Now, there's a few key terms that we need to keep into account here when we're uh, referring to calorimetry. The system, 
is the area of the universe we're studying. So if you've got a coffee cup calorimeter, which we're going to be doing, the system is inside the calorimeter, studying the reaction that's occurring in this calorimeter. The surroundings are anywhere outside of the system. And what you have to keep in mind is that, by definition, the surroundings is everything in the universe, not part of the system. So it's not just the immediate surroundings, it's the classroom, the school, Lakefield. Okay? It goes on and on and on. The boundary is what separates the system from the surroundings. And our goal is to not have heat lost through the boundary. So we often use an insulated system. So energy is not able to cross the boundary. And that's why we use a coffee cup, because it's insulated. Open system is that it's open to the atmosphere. Closed system is that it's close to the atmosphere. A few other important terms here are heat and temperature, and it's important to distinguish between them. Okay. Temperature is the measure of aver average kinetic energy of the particles in the system. So it gives us an idea of how much heat is available. But the temperature is not the heat. Okay. Heat is actually something that flows from one place to another. And so when you have heat, it's really a transfer of kinetic energy from one place to another. Okay, so it's important to distinguish between these. Temperature just gives you the average kinetic energy, and then heat is what actually flows from one thing to the other. When we're studying calorimetry, you have a choice of working in kelvins or in degrees Celsius. Because we're going to be finding the change in temperature, as you'll see in a moment, it doesn't matter what unit we use, because the absolute difference is going to be the same. Now, when we look at the formula Q is equal to mc delta T, this is the formula that we use to find heat, or Q. And this highlights the three factors that affect the amount of heat in the system, or the amount of heat, or kinetic energy, available to be transferred. The mass, the specific heat capacity, and the change in temperature, or the temperature, sorry. So, this here is just a discussion of those three factors. So if you think about it, this makes sense. The mass affects the amount of heat available for transfer. So if you've got a lake at the same temperature as a mug of coffee, clearly there's more energy available for transfer in the lake. Temperature, two equal amounts of water with different temperatures. So if you've got 100 milliliters of water at 100 degrees Celsius or at 5 degrees Celsius, there is much more heat available to be transferred to something else in the one at the higher temperature. Another thing that affects the amount of heat available for transfer is the specific heat capacity. So if you've got two samples of different materials, they're going to have a different specific heat capacity. They're going to have a different amount of heat available to be transferred when they're at the same temperature. So think of a bar of copper versus a bar of iron. Okay? Those are two different materials. If you heat them both up, they'll have a different amount of heat available for transfer. The reason that materials have a different amount of heat available for transfer is because of a property called the specific heat capacity. The specific heat capacity is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. I always use the units to help me to remember the definition. The units of specific heat capacity are joules, so the amount of energy per gram degree Celsius needed to raise one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Okay, so there's a table in your textbook with specific heat capacities. We can also look at the heat capacity of a sample and the molar heat capacity of a substance, but the specific heat capacity is the one that's going to be most important to us. Just a couple of examples here of examples of specific heat capacity and how you experience it in your everyday life. If you think about in the summertime thinking of sitting on a wood bench versus an aluminum bench, I'm sure many of you would 
choose to sit on a wood bench over an aluminum bench because the aluminum bench on a hot sunny day is going to be quite hot. And if you look at their specific heat capacities, in lies the answer. Aluminum has a very low specific heat capacity, meaning it takes very little energy to raise the temperature by X number of degrees Celsius. While as wood, it takes more energy to raise the temperature. So on the same day, an aluminum bench is going to get much hotter. The opposite is true for the evening. At, in the evening, the aluminum bench is going to cool down much quicker, while the wood bench is going to stay a more similar temperature to during the day. And that's because something with a low specific heat capacity not only does it heat up quickly with little energy applied, but it cools down quickly, so it doesn't hold the heat in the same way. Water, which is what we're going to be using most often, has a specific heat capacity of 4.18. And this is considered a very high specific heat capacity. And because of the hydrogen bonding in water, it takes a significant amount of energy to raise the temperature of a gram of it by a degree. This applies to you because in the springtime you think of needing to wait a really long time for the lake to warm up, but if you are wanting to swim in the fall, even though it's been cool, it holds its heat for a longer period of time. Okay. Sand and water also have the same kind of comparison as wood and aluminum. Okay. Sand has a low specific heat capacity and it cools up, sorry, cools down and heats up okay, during the day and at night. Now ultimately we, what we want to do is be able to solve problems where an experiment has been completed and we want to calculate the delta H for a particular scenario. These are the things that we're going to need to take into account. So I'll touch on them briefly, but ultimately this is going to be kind of a reference for you for solving these problems. One of the most important concepts is that whatever the amount of energy that is lost by one thing is gained by another thing. So what we need to keep in mind when we're doing experiments is that although we've got the reaction, okay, you've got the reaction, but you are measuring the temperature okay, of the solution. Okay, so I measure the temperature of the solution, and if this reaction releases heat, then the solution is going to absorb energy. Okay, so the process for the solution is endothermic because it's absorbing heat, but the reaction is exothermic because it's lost heat. Okay? And the opposite is true for an endothermic process. If a reaction is endothermic, it's going to absorb heat, causing the temperature to drop. So this is the solution in this case is losing heat or has an exothermic process, while the reaction an endothermic process. So the heat of the solution is always the opposite sign to the heat of the reaction. The amount of energy that's transferred is exactly equal, but the signs are opposite. We're going to use the Q is equal to MC delta T to help us solve these problems. Okay, because if you take into account all of those factors, so if you take the grams and you multiply by the specific heat capacity, joules per gram, degrees Celsius, times the temperature change, okay, what you're going to see is that you are left with joules, which is the heat. Step two and three here will become more clear when we look at some practice problems, but ultimately what we need to do is change our Q into a delta H by making it appropriate for the balanced chemical equation. We need to make sure that we're creating a thermochemical equation where the delta H is in the same consistent stoichiometry with the equation. Now there's a couple of different kinds of calorimeters. The, this calorimeter in this diagram is called a bomb calorimeter, and it would be used if I wanted to, for example, measure the heat of combustion of something. It's got a bomb, which is this, this part here is called the bomb. It's the um, 
the sample jar, like so it's very insulated. And what we would do is we would ignite something in here. Heat's going to be released and it's going to cause the temperature of this water around here to change and we monitor the temperature of the water in the outside of the bomb. Okay, so this is a constant volume system. So we're not going to be studying constant volume systems. We're going to look at a constant pressure system. We're going to use a styrofoam coffee cup calorimeter, okay, which are great because they're well insulated. So let's look at an, 